Pokemon was a franchise that I never got to experience much as a kid. My mother heard from them televangelists that the games and show had the power to cause brainwashing, violence, and demon possession, because why not? So, as you can guess, it's one of the many things that I was banned from watching or playing as a kid. Even in Smash Bros, I never played as Pokemon characters unless I absolutely had to. Um, if I had to unlock characters and stuff. And whenever I did do that, I had to mute the TV or unplug the AV cable or, or the audio cable, the, you know, the white one and red one or whatever, and just hope no one walked in. It wasn't until middle school where I finally was able to experience the internet without any censorship, and I realized something. The games weren't evil after all. And then I started watching the anime and watching other people's let's plays of the game, and uh, I really liked it. My first Pokemon game was actually the 3DS Virtual Console version of Red when I was 14. By then, you don't have quite the same sense of nostalgia when you first experience something. So I'm really sad I'll never have the same connection as a lot of other people because the Pokemon series is awesome. Sure, some fans can go overboard, and most fans prefer the older games compared to the newer ones, as do I. I do love Gen 1 to death, and Gen 2 as well, with the general consensus being that the best game in the franchise is Gold and Silver. My personal favorite though is the third installment in the franchise, Pokemon Ruby, Sapphire, and most of all, Emerald. And I know hundreds and hundreds of people have already made their own retrospect videos on Gen 3, but I can never hope to even come close to topping, and uh, I say screw it to that. Here's my perspective on the games as a whole, their highs, their lows, and my personal opinion of them as a whole. Alright, let's begin. To start things off, the version I'm playing, as you can all guess, um, unless, you know, you're being held hostage to watch this or something. I don't know why you would be, but if you are, okay, I'm sorry, I, it kind of came out randomly. What the heck is wrong with me? Anyway, I'll be playing Emerald, mostly because of all the new content and all the improvements made. Those of you playing Ruby and Sapphire instead are going to have a slightly different experience than me, so keep that in mind. Upon starting a new save, we get the typical introduction cutscene, only this time with a different professor, Birch. And of course, you get to choose your gender and name. Now, I could have named my trainer after my own name, or his official name, or Brendan, and Ralph Leaf, or something, but in honor of the great Chuga Conroy, the man who introduced me to this masterpiece, I'm going to name my trainer after him. And a lot of people are gonna think that, uh, I'm using his footage or whatever because I'm using the Game Boy Player 2, so... Eh. Oh, well, never mind. Right off the bat, everything feels a lot different than the start of the previous two adventures. There's a heavier emphasis on the plot with main characters moving to the Hoenn region. But the number one thing that separates this from other Pokemon games is that you actually have a dad! Why there are so many single moms in Pokemon is anyone's guess. The rival in this game is also much different than a hot-headed blue, or the morally corrupt silver. Here, your rival is the regional professor's son slash daughter, who is always the avatar of the opposite gender you choose. If you choose to play as a boy, whose name is Brendan, your rival is May. If you choose to play as May, your rival is Brendan. These two were the first pair of adversaries to actually be friendly towards the player, encouraging them and giving them stuff. Sure, we might have too many friendly opponents in modern Pokemon games today, but here I feel like this dynamic works. Then there's all the shipping between the two, which is kind of weird, um, since they're young, you know, but I will admit, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of cute in a way. And I wouldn't be surprised if the developers intended for it to be canon. Uh, still, don't, 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 don't go too far, guys, please, please for the love of God, don't. You also have Wally, who's okay, I guess, and I can relate to him in some ways, but you barely fight him, so I wouldn't really consider him a main rival. Moving on, we have the Generation Starters, Torchic, Trico, and Mudkip. Out of the three, Mudkip is most people's preferred choice, although mine is personally Torchic. For this playthrough though, I managed to trade some other starters that I bred, or actually just when I bought this game, um, had another save file on there with a mudkip, so I managed to transfer that, then from another save file of this game, I had a Blaziken, but I bred a uh, Torchic for that, and then I chose Trico, so for this playthrough, I actually had all, all three starters, which made my team pretty overpowered to say the least, but I'm not complaining. In fact, I was a bit too overpowered, because until you get the second gym badge, any Pokemon traded won't obey you if they're above level 10. And that happened to me for quite a while, until I got the second gym badge. Torchic evolves into Combustion, which evolves into Blaziken, and Blaziken is one of my favorite starters ever. It's half fighting type, which can really come in handy, and I just really like it. And then you have Mudkip, 
which is probably, honestly, the most useful early on in the game since it's pretty effective against most gym leaders and it's water ground type so it's immune to electricity and super effective against it. So I really like Mudkip, it evolves into uh, Marsh Top and then evolves into Swampert and Swampert is a beast. And finally there's Trico, it evolves into Grovile and then into Skeptile, although it doesn't have a dual typing, making it the least useful of the three in my opinion. A problem all three of them share is not learning very good moves for a really long time. In fact, unless you stop them from evolving, you can't learn good moves like Flamethrower or Hydra Pump without a TM. So for a while you're stuck with moves like Water Gun, and Absorb, and Ember, and the rest of my team was was good. I got a Gardevoir and named it after someone everyone on this channel knows about, at least I think they do. I also got a Skarmory and for my final team member, a Wallerin. I think I'm pronouncing that right. You no, know, I really don't know the pronunciations of a lot of Pokemon. I haven't watched anime in a long time. And yeah, while I did miss out on a few move types, it still worked out okay in the end. One aspect that was a step back from Gold and Silver is the time cycle. In Gold and Silver, the time cycle is super impressive. The graphics change at night compared to day. There's a weekly schedule where you can collect berries each day and certain Pokemon can only be caught at certain times. Ruby and Sapphire does have a time system, but instead of being weekly, it's only daily. Not only that, the lighting doesn't change at night, and there are no time of day exclusive Pokemon, and not nearly as many time based events. Honestly, other than berries and certain evolutions, Shulk Cave, and something called Mirage Island, there's not really anything based around a clock. On a bright side, though, the battery used to keep the clock going when the game's off uh, isn't a save battery. The game's save data is saved to internal memory, or um, flash memory, I mean. So basically, when a battery goes dead, you just can't time-based events no longer work, which is awesome. Unlike Gen 2 games where a battery dies within a decade and you lose all your save data when it runs out of juice, I also sometimes get kind of annoyed by the day and night cycle, since I usually only play games in the evenings because it's the only time I can, and as such, there are certain things I can't do unless I get a day off or something. So I'm not too annoyed with the Gen 3 time system, honestly. Like with any new generation, Gen 3 added a whole bunch of new features and elements, the most impactful being abilities. Sure, I will admit that they can be overcomplicated or annoying at times, but they do add a lot to the mix. You can now run with B as well, which is awesome, and some new bikes are added, the fast mock bike, an easier to control but slower arch bike. But that's nowhere near close to the new things added, there's double battles, the battle tent, contests, new pokeball types, secret phases, customizable dialogue, new moves, new pokemon, and just fun little things, like the pokeball type you catch a pokemon with, is the same one they come out of at the start of a match. But the thing that makes this my favorite in the franchise is the Pokenov, an emerald at least. Something very similar was in Ruby and Sapphire, but emerald took it a huge step forward. The Pokenov works sort of like a phone. Throughout your journey, you meet new people and write their number down. Occasionally, they'll call you and sometimes even challenge you to a rematch. Well, however, what makes it so good is the fact that you can re-challenge gym leaders. Why this feature is pretty much never used again, I'll never know. The point is, being able to re-challenge trainers makes grinding experience and especially money so much easier and I love it. However, one thing they did not learn and did not improve upon or HMs. No, I, like everyone else, I just like HMs. An overworld feels a bit less, um, feels a, a bit less odd if you need a certain move to go for instead of some item or having to wait for a bridge to be fixed. It, in some way, it kind of feels more realistic, if that makes any sense. I do get that, that HM's purpose. My problem is, why does there need to be so many? This game has eight HMs. That means if you want a, a team with all the HM moves, like a third of your roster's moveset is already taken. Now, you could probably get a woo only using an HM slave for the ones you barely use, like Waterfall, and Dive, and Flash, maybe Strength, but I still wish there were a lot less of them. Like in any other Pokemon game, Hoenn has gyms and gym leaders, and they feel pretty solid, honestly. The first gym leader, Roxanne, is a rock type difficulty wall for people who chose a fire starter. Next is Brawly. He uses fighting types and is regarded to many as the most difficult in the series because of how much damage his Pokemon do after, after winning, I guess. But I'd recommend using Talo and Brawls or Kadabra against him. Third, you have Walt, who uses electric types and is pretty easy, honestly. 
simple, it depends what your team is. If you have Marsh Top, he's ridiculously easy. And then you have one of the most popular in the series, Flannery. I will admit, I had a pretty big crush on her as a teen. Hope no one's around to hear that. She uses fire typed, and what I like about her is um, she's kind of relatable with how inexperienced she is and having just become a gym leader recently. After that, you have your dad. I really hate this fight, to be honest. Uh, he uses normal types with high attack and high HP, so you have to take him out pretty fast, but hardly anything can do that unless you're over level. My trick is to just spam overheat, and double kick maybe, but double kick isn't that good against it. Then you have Winoa, and she's pretty mad overall, she's ridiculously easy, but there are a lot of other better flying type leaders, in my opinion. In Mosti, there's, well, I think the most over-prepared gym leader I've ever been against of all time, because my first playthrough of this game, the gym leaders in, uh, in, in Moss Deep are Tate and Liz, and they destroyed me the first time I played this game, because psychic types in my team just sucked against them. But this time, my team was awesome against them. I, you know, first time I played this, I didn't really have any good water types or ghost types, but this time I taught Shadow Ball to Gardevoir, and I had, um, Swamp hurt, so I didn't even lose one Pokemon in this fight. I steamrolled them this time, so that makes me feel a lot better. And lastly, you have Wallace, or Juan, depending on which version of the game you play. He uses water type, so you'd think he's pretty easy to beat in. Well, y y not really. Even with you know, a grass type Skeptile, still had some difficulty. In my first playthrough of this game, our fight devolved into a struggle steal me with me spamming Hyper Potion until his Pokemon all died. So overall, I love all the gym leaders of Hoenn, and this particular rendition of the victory theme is just excellent. All the other tunes are pretty good too, with their own distinct 32-bit style. I know I've already said this before, but visually the game looks very good too. I feel like Gen 3 has aged better than most other retro Pokemon games, with the exception of Gen 5. All the sprites are well detailed and colorful, with almost nothing looking ugly or aged. Oh, but we can't talk about this game and not mention Region's evil teams, Aqua and Magma. Unlike other evil teams who have a goal to just take over the world, both these gangs want to use the power of two very different legendary Pokemon to try to change the world into what they want it to be. Team Aqua, led by Archie, wants to flood the world and make more room for water Pokemon, while Magma, led by Maxi, wants to make more land for humans and land Pokemon. I do like the contrast between the two, it adds quite a thrill of them constantly trying to forward each other's plans. You take it on both of them, and you run into them quite a few times in the game. They steal stuff from people, steal special orbs from Mount Prism, which is a spooky area of the game by the way, and then you raid their bases and find a Master Ball in Team Aqua's base. In Team Magma's base, they resurrect Groudon, but he doesn't obey Maxi, leading to a battle with him. Team Aqua, meanwhile, steals a submarine, but by the time you reach them, it's too late. Team Magma then trusts to steal rocket fuel from his space center. You stop them, and then Steven, a significant character in the game's story, gives you HM8 Dive. It gives you the ability to go underwater, which, while I did say earlier that I hate HMs, I kind of like diving underwater. On the surface, you'll see a whole bunch of dark blue spots indicating an area you can dive down in. The sea floor below is a cool area with its lack of light, relaxing music, and it's fun to explore. In a cave deep below is Archie's sub, in a cavern, and at the end of it is Kyogre, who is resurrected as well. And like Groudon, he doesn't obey either, and leaves. Just after that, Archie gets a call from his crew about the weather. All throughout Hoenn, a downpour never seen before starts flooding the region. If nothing changes, the whole world will be flooded. Both Maxi and Archie regret their decisions and pledge to change their ways. After this, you can still move around the sea. The fast falling rain really does make you feel paranoid. However, what happens here is different depending on which version of the game you're playing. In Sapphire and Emerald, the world floods. But in Ruby, instead of a flood, there's a drought with some of the creepiest music I have ever seen in a Pokemon game. Oh, heard in a Pokemon game. 
uh, after the old Chateau and maybe Lavender Town, but honestly, Lavender Town never really creeped me out. But this kind of does because, I mean, it, I forgot who said this once, and someone once said it was a video, but um, the world being flooded isn't as bad as the drought because if the world flooded, well, then, you know, deep underwater, there'd still be water Pokemon that could survive. People would be screwed and land Pokemon would be screwed, but. You know, they water Pokemon would be fine, but with the drought, literally nothing would survive next to nothing. So yeah, I, it's it's kind of unnerving. In Pseudopolis, Groudon and Kyogre have a battle with Kyogre coming out on top, hence the downpour. And the city is the Cave of Origin. In Ruby, you'll find Groudon. In Sapphire, you find Kyogre. But in Emerald, you find Wallace, the Pokemon League champion. He tells the player of a third super ancient Pokemon with the power to stop the struggle between the other two at a place called Sky Pillar. The top of the pillar is one of the most iconic legendaries in the series, Rayquaza. It flies off to Pseudopolis and stops Groudon and Kyogre from having their epic battle, unfortunately, because I really wanted to see how about Ed. Uh, but it's, they, it scares them so much they run off like frightened dogs, and everything goes back to normal. Unfortunately, you can't capture Groudon or Kyogre quite yet, not until you beat the Elite Four. You can in Emerald, however, catch Rayquaza before the Elite Four, which is a great thing. This time, your climb up Sky Pillar is much, 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 much more difficult. And it's all because of this stretch right here, you have to get, be on a mock, mock bike, you can't even use the other bike, the art bike. Um, then you have to go as fast as possible across these cracks, and if you aren't fast enough, uh, you move too soon or whatever, you you hit this rock, and then you fall down. You have to climb all the way back up, get on your bike again, and the music that keeps repeating over and over. I uh, keep hearing the same part of the bike song in the first part of the Sky Pillar theme over and over. It drives you nuts. It takes forever to do it. That's not enough. Uh, if you finally make the first free um, bike turns, well, you have to slow down right in between these two cracks and fall down to ones in the middle. If you make it to one's the end, you bet you're back at the beginning of this whole thing. So, yeah, this right here is one of my least favorite parts of a Pokemon game ever. I mean, it's not that hard, honestly. It took, take, took me, like, what, 12 minutes? But it's just really annoying, and I, I don't like it. But once it's over, the player is met with a level 70 Rayquaza to try and catch. Now at this point, your team is probably going to be around 40 or so, meaning just one or two attacks from Rayquaza can probably take out your Pokemon. It also knows rest, which is annoying. But when I did this myself during this playthrough, I had the luck of my life and caught him in only a few turns, not even at red health. Now if I can only find a shiny, then I'd be really lucky. I want to find a shiny someday. I, I, I've never encountered a shiny in my life. I guess in Crystal I had that um, um, Iggly buffed egg, but that doesn't really count because that's a 1% chance, not a 1 in 8,000 chance. But um, anyway, back to this Rayquaza. This Rayquaza will destroy pretty much everything in the main game. The Elite Four, uh, the only thing I think, the final, final optional battle in this game, I think, you know, can get defeated by, but... This thing is a beast. As for other Hoenn legendaries, there's three more you can get before beating the game. Over in this one area of the sea is a strange dive spot. Underneath is a cavern with braille, but you need to decipher. The instruction manual for the game did come with a translation guide for it, but if you're like me and never had it, looking up an online guide is mandatory. First, you have to find two hard to get Pokemon. Relic Camp, it can be found in certain deep sea areas with a 5% chance of running into it down here, and thankfully I found it in only a few minutes. The other Pokemon you need for this is Whale Lord. To get one, you have two choices. You can catch a Whalemur and level it up to level 40, or you can try to catch a wild one on Route 129. The catch is that there's only a 1% chance of encountering a Whale Lord here. I tried for hours to try and catch one, but I never encountered even one. But I remembered, I already had one on another copy of this game, so I just traded it over and went back to the diving area underwater. Beneath the waves is a hidden braille message that tells the player to return to the surface, doing so places them in a secret chamber. You just dig on the door, enter the next room, place Whale Lord in the front of your party and Relic Camp in the back, and read the sign. This causes the cave to shake violently, and a mysterious door somewhere opens up. 
and various areas throughout Hoenn caves pop up. There's one in the desert, one in the sea, and one in the marshland. In each of these, there's more cryptic confusion, like walking in a full circle around the room, using rock smash or flash in a certain spot. Like I said earlier, these rooms contain clues of what to do in braille, and the instruction manual, again, did come with a translation guide. I can't imagine, though, how it felt to do this before the internet. That must have been pretty cool. I'm sure someone managed to figure this out without a guide, and when I did, it must have felt so mysterious and magical, which is something that, while I am grateful for the modern internet um, and their guides, I'm kind of taken away from that from newer games, although I don't want to be stuck for like 30 hours trying to figure something out in a game, so... Anyway, after you solve each puzzle, a final room opens up, revealing a new Pokémon each time. Reggie Rock, Reggie Ice, and Reggie Steel. They look so cool, and I feel like they really fit in a place like this, an underground tomb that's mysterious, and then being like golems. This is cool. Reminds me of my episode of Tetra Terror. Another cool thing about them is how they actually might represent the various epochs throughout history. Regirock is the Stone Age, Reggie Ice is the Ice Age, Reggie Steel is the Iron Age, In later installments, more legendary titans were added. Regilekai represents the Modern Age, and Reggie Drago represents the Middle Ages. They also happen to have a boss, Reggie Gaius. He's introduced in the next game in the series, but that's a topic for another day. Moving back to this game, Regirock is a rock type, obviously, because why wouldn't he be? He has good defense, and it knows Rock Throw, Curse, Ancient Power, and Super Power, the latter of the two being able to wreck your team. Well, actually, not really, because my team was overleveled. Um, Reggie Ice is an Ice type, obviously, because why wouldn't it be? It has good special defense, and it was Curse, Super Power, Icy Wind, and Ancient Power. And last but not least, we have Reggie Steel. The Steel type has good defense, and like the other two, it knows Curse. Super Power, Ancient Power, alongside Metal Claw. Unfortunately, I did not have such an easy time here, unlike with Rayquaza. It took me like an hour alone just to catch Reggie Rock. It's partially my fault just because of how overleveled I was, and uh, just it was kind of annoying because I kept killing them over and over again and couldn't chip down their health to almost nothing because I would have killed them. And yeah, overall though, I kind of like the idea of having to be a detective to try to figure out how to get the Reggies. The execution wasn't done perfectly though, I think it, it is a bit too cryptic, especially since you need to be instruction manual to be able to figure it out, eh, but it's, it's cool. With that taken care of, there's only one more thing to do. Take on the Pokemon League. Like in every other Pokemon game, the player needs to get past one of the longest and most difficult dungeons in each respective game, Victory Road. Here, you fight strong trainers, solve tough puzzles that make me feel like a moron, face up against high-level wild Pokemon, and run out of repels halfway through, slowly bringing on insanity. This particular rendition of the Victory Road theme, though, is a track I'll never forget. The first time I heard it was in Brawl because, you know, like I said in the beginning of the video, I couldn't play Pokemon as a kid, and I could play Smash Bros, so I remember uh, hearing this in the Subspace Emissary, and I didn't know what it was from for years until I actually played this game back when I was in high school a couple of years ago, but when I heard this, it brought all those nostalgic memories to me, and you know, it was, a, it was a good time. And now I think about it, I have nostalgia, we're at time, when I had nostalgia of Smash Bros, so I have nostalgia of nostalgia, and you know what, when I was um, having nostalgia for the first time when I was playing Smash Bros, Brawl, I probably had nostalgia of an earlier time, I think like when I was playing the original Smash Bros, and I probably had nostalgia when I was playing the original Smash Bros, of something even earlier. You know what, probably like 10 years from now, I'm probably in a nostalgia of now, so... You know, it really layers, and I'm starting to get kind of insane right now, so... Um, let's move on. Right at the end is Wally. Remember him? Yeah, me neither. You only fight him like twice in the whole game, and yet you can rematch him on like May slash Brendan for some odd reason. I never got that, honestly. Like, why can you rematch Wally but not May slash Brendan? Because May slash Brendan is the main rival of this game. Uh, speaking of that too, one thing I always found was weird is how in the final fight is just really anticlimactic. Like, I keep forgetting it's the final fight in the game because you don't even fight uh, their 
final starter. Like, the starter is, you know, is the opposite of what you choose, obviously, but it never fully evolves. It gets to its second evolution, but not its third. I don't... Uh, some people think that you're originally intended to be the champion or something, and then you fight their third form of that Pokemon, but it's, it just feels kind of incomplete, honestly. But, you know, this game's... This game is good enough to where I don't find it a major problem, but it's, it's, it is one thing I kind of don't like about this game. Anyway, with that done, it's time for the climax of the adventure, the Elite Four. The first member is Sydney. He uses dark types and is the easiest to beat. Second up is Phoebe. She uses ghost types and her strategy is just to annoy you. After that is Glacia. She uses Ice type, and while her Pokemon are strong, and her Wallerin knows Sheer Cold, which is an instant kill move, with some smart typing, she's pretty easy. And lastly, there's Drake. His Pokemon are Dragon types, and are strong enough to knock out your Pokemon pretty easily, especially a Salamance. Following that, it's the real final challenge, the last obstacle between a player and the end game, the champion. In Ruby and Sapphire, the champion is Steven, who was a good choice since he's a major character throughout the game's story, but in Emerald, it took the 8th gym leader of Ruby and Sapphire, Wallace, and made him the champion instead, and then placed a new gym leader at his gym. Wallace honestly doesn't work as well as Steven, especially since his team are mostly water-based. And if you have electric type or grass type, he's a piece of cake, unless you're under level. To be honest, it's on me though, because I really overprepared for this fight. I thought it'd be way harder than it was. Still though, it doesn't quite have the same feel that was there with Blue or Cynthia or even Lance. At least the music is pretty good though, and him being too easy is way, way better than him being a relentless difficulty spike. After being bested, Wallace seems to take things pretty well like Lance. Professor Birch may come in to congratulate the player, the new champion and her Pokemon are added to the Hall of Fame, and the credits play. These credits are a huge step up compared to the first two games. You have some cutscenes that show off May and Brendan biking together and exploring around the world. And that's it for the main adventure. It's been quite a journey, but it's far from over. Upon restarting the game, you start off back where the adventure started in Little Root. And now, after beating the main story, there's a lot more stuff to do post-game. Firstly, Professor Birch upgrades the Hoenn Pokedex to the National Dex. Next, if you visit the Weather Station, the meteorologist says something about a drought and a flood on a random route. In each of these respective areas is a secret cave and dive spot leading to Kyogre and Groudon. And this time you finally catch them, but it's only possible to catch both of them in Emerald. In Ruby, you get Groudon in the Cave of Origin. And in Sapphire, it's Kyogre in the Cave of Origin. And in both of them, it's Rayquaza you can't capture until the post game. And after that, there's one more legendary left to capture. Well, what of two actually? And you get to choose which one by answering either red or blue when your mom asks you what color the TV announcer said it was. If you chose red, it's Latias. And if you choose blue, it's Latios. And it's only possible to get one or the other per save file. Regardless of which one you pick, catching either of them isn't easy. Why? Because they're roaming legendaries. I'm gonna take a quick moment to say that I think roaming legendaries is probably one of my least favorite things about the Pokemon franchise. I don't want to spend too long explaining how they work, this video is already getting long enough as it is, but to sum things up, to encounter one, uh, you have to encounter it on a random route. There's no way of knowing where they are the first time, making the first time tracking it down a nightmare. After that, you can see where they are with the Pokedex, thankfully. That's not the worst part of it, though. The worst part is how they run away after only one turn. I'm kind of thankful it's only possible to catch one of them, though, so I can just use my Master Ball on the one I chose and just move on with my life. Alright, this video is starting to get a bit too long, so I'll wrap things up here soon. But, before I do, here's one last major thing available in the post-game, but only in Emerald, the Battle Frontier. Here you can fight in a huge, and I mean huge, variety of events. There's so much to do here. Maybe too much. Whenever I get to this point, I'm always too burnt out or ha don't have the desire to continue on, so I've never completed everything there is to do here. Not that it's easy. The AI is hard, your opponents are always as strong as you. It takes hours and hours to get close to getting anything done, or getting to the frontier brains, which are basically gym leaders. Yeah, I'm sorry guys, I'm, I'm not doing this for you. I don't want to have to spend another 30 hours playing this game just to get my ass kicked by these guys. 
And as a final challenge, but only an emerald, Steven appears in the cave on Meteor Falls, and is the strongest trainer in the game, being like Red from Gold and Silver. It's a pretty intense battle overall. As you can guess, he has some strong Pokemon, Yaya is pretty good, and you have to be pretty high leveled, and this is the trainer I was talking about when you can take out your Rayquaza. And, um, yeah, I, I will admit, I, I just spammed Hyper Potions the whole time, so, it, sue me. Pokemon Emerald is, and will most likely always be my favorite Pokemon game. There's just something about it that I can't put into words why I love it so much. I know I say that a lot, but this time, I, I, cause I didn't get to play this game until I was like, in high school, so it's kind of past nostalgia, or of my childhood nostalgia, but I'd say honestly this is the last game I think I ever felt super nostalgic about. Um, not childhood nostalgia, like teenage nostalgia, I was about 17. I already started this YouTube channel by the time I got to play it. Um, it was like about the time I was making like the NES and Nintendo Fury videos, you know. This generation added on to the things that made Gen 1 and 2 so great, but didn't add too much to overcomplicate things like the games that came after it. It's too bad that Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald didn't get the attention they deserved when they first came out in the early 2000s. No one hated them per se, but everyone was temporarily sick of the series by then. Nowadays though, I'm glad that it's regarded as one of the greatest installments in the franchise, and seen 2 as the best GBA game of all time. Unfortunately, my playthrough of this game for this video um, hasn't been as fun as it should have been. You know, um, I've, I've had a lot going on in my personal life, you know. Uh, I had a family member pass away, and there's a lot of other stuff going on right now. Um, I'm not gonna lie though, this game, it, it helps me, you know. It gave me something to get my mind on and off of stuff, and uh, I am very thankful for that. I also apologize to everyone for not uploading very often these past couple months, and not uploading at all for the past month. Uh, I promise I'll try to pump out stuff more often for the rest of the year, and hopefully, you know, quite a while. Um, and with that, I bid you all farewell until next time where we'll be covering the next game in the Pokemon franchise, Pokemon Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum. I'll see you all then, everyone.